was asked to talk about design, which is a little unusual for a demonstration. Usually we see chips fly. I may, I may tell one or two jokes in the process, because uh, if you're not laughing, then I'll know that you were asleep. <laughs> but, yeah. A little bit about my background. Um, most of you know I'm a retired architect. I had a firm here with a partner, uh, a fairly large office in Fairlawn for about 25 years. I'm retired now for about 10 years or so. Uh, in that process of architectural training, you learn a lot about proportion, scale, symmetry, color, uh, natural texture, which can carry over into all design. In addition, uh, my wife of 55 years um, was a ceramist, as many of you know, uh, fairly well known in northeastern Ohio. We traveled the country for 30 years with her work to juried art shows. So I've been exposed to many, many, many artists of all kinds of mediums. And um, as you all know, a design carries over into all the various artistic mediums. So I've been exposed to a lot. What I say today will be personal observations of things that I've seen in other work. I'll have my own opinions and prejudices. And you may disagree. And if you do, please speak up. We'll talk from notes because there's much to cover. I've brought along mostly large pieces so that the camera can pick up what I'm talking about, if possible. I would like to have uh, some discussion with questions and clarifications, uh, uh, things you may disagree with. I'll basically talk about bowls and platters because the design criteria carries over into all the other things that we do. A little history. Up until about 1960, most wood turning was um, generally ornate and utilitarian. Uh, as you all have seen in museums and so forth, things like Chippendale furniture with turnings that have been applied, etc., are always uh, very, very well done uh, using almost flawless woods. And along about 1960, uh, people like Dave, David Ellsworth, Rudy Solnek, Dale Nish, Mark Lind Lindquist, came along and started using wood that was somewhat distressed. It had cracks, it had burrow characteristics, um, it had knots, it had natural edge pieces, and things like that. That had not been seen prior to about 1960. And so, in coordination with that, a lot of manufacturers began making things like chucks, which we now use almost as a standard procedure. But in those days, it was uh, uh, screws on a screw on a faceplate. You'd cover the holes with a piece of felt or whatever. So things have changed from a mechanical standpoint also. <clears throat> Now, nowadays, uh, people like Jack Vessery, Hans Weisslaw, Cindy Droza, Ben Foe, and others have things in galleries and museums and permanent collections of all kinds using wood that is distressed. And prior to 1960, that was unheard of. Now, today's presentation will cover Curves, bases, rims, proportions, details, texture, color, how the piece might be viewed, effects of lighting on the piece, whether it's artistic or aesthetic or utilitarian piece, nature of the wood, uh, various species, 
orientation of the grain. All of these things are considerations when you're making a piece on the lathe. I would also like to introduce another criteria, and that is tactile feel. Tactile feel is very important. Things like weight, balance, grasp of the piece, ability to pick it up, weight distribution, uh, all of these things are subtle uh, um, ingredients to the aesthetic expression. Now the process, arriving at good proportions, creating good curves, deciding an appropriate base, detailing a compatible rim, addition of coves, beads, textures, etc., is a difficult process and is always, and I repeat always, subject to improvement, if ever so subtle, especially if viewed in profile. We'll talk about that later. The quality of the profile is of paramount importance. Suggests, it suggests curvatures intersections of the rim and the base and dictates the profile when you're looking at it in straight level. And I'll show you some examples of that. Which now begs the question, is the piece going to be utilitarian or just an artistic piece? Now, by a utilitarian, I would suggest something like a simple salad bowl. Simple salad bowl is obviously a utilitarian piece. I like to return the outside edge so it's easy to grasp at the table. It has an in-cut uh, rim to contain the uh, food from spilling over. But it's a very simple utilitarian piece. In contrast, a piece like this would be considered purely for viewing. It has no purpose, no utilitarian purpose, other than simply to look at and maybe hold, pick up, etc. The same thing can be said for a piece like this, which has no particular purpose. It's simply an artistic piece for viewing. I suppose you could put apples or something in it if you wanted to, but not necessarily. Now on the other hand, a piece like this is what I might call a tweener. This could be used as a utilitarian piece. You could put fruit or something in it on the table, or you could put it on a, a uh, stand and simply look at it. So it's an in-between in between piece. Another piece that is, I would say, a tweener, you could use that as a bowl, or you could use it as something simply to look at on the table. So you need to think about, when you're starting the piece, whether it's going to be utilitarian or a purely artistic piece. Now there are several major considerations, one of which is proportion. Using this as an example, this is a cherry crotch with a carved rim. There is some relationship in proportion between the size of the rim and the balance of the bowl. It can be wider or narrower. You'll see later some other examples. I purposely stopped the carving where the crotch comes through the piece. It's wider on one side than the other, and that's fine. But it all comes together as a proportion, um, a balanced proportion, I hope, in the making of this particular piece. Talk about balance 
of visual balance of a piece. This is a very small example. You wouldn't know it, but this is turned on two axes. It's thinner on this side than it is on this side, purposely so that the ball could rest on a thickened uh, side of the little vessel. It has no purpose, simply a balanced, what I call a balanced proportion. The ball balances the arch of the rim. It's very simple. Another example of that would be this piece. What I attempted to accomplish here was a suggestion of a swirling piece of wood as it would be on the lathe. This is wood burned and some carving to counterbalance that on the various portions of the piece. A simple bowl. This is Brazilian cherry, quite old. I think it's maybe 10 years old. But again, the suggestion of motion was attempted on this piece with this swirling action as it might come off the lathe. We talk about rhythm in pieces also. This piece is again very simple. It's a rather simple bowl, but I decided to make some rings, again showing motion, and to counterbalance that, a button in the middle. It's not too thin, I wasn't worried about it going through. <laughs> but that was part of the design. 95% of the time I think about it on the lathe. I rarely draw anything other than say the mask over here. Um, even, this, even this piece, uh, I thought about that after it was on the lathe. I said, what can I do with this to um, achieve some sort of an insert? So then I, I probably went to a piece of paper and drew some different designs of where I could cut the maple insert. Obviously, this is, is laid under the rim, so there had to be some, some grooves or some voids where I could work the pieces underneath to glue them. So in a case like that, I may have gone to a piece of paper and tried some different things. But in answer to the question, probably not. Um, the, the swirl pattern was probably another example of that, where I may have done that on paper. I introduced another piece done with one of our members. You saw this last uh, month on the show and tell table. Um, this rim is very unusual and extremely well done. Most people think of returning that rim up. But in this case, it's very successful. Uh, this is done by Len Widmer. You saw this on the table last month. It's echoed on the back with some uh, very nicely done beads. Repetitive. We'll talk about that again later. But this echoes the front. Very well done piece. Tactile feel. Um, this next piece is again a piece of babinga. This I did do uh, with a, a drawing first to decide where these lines should be because the direction of the Dremel carving needs to be in such fashion that it can't intersect the next section with the same orientation. So I had to figure out how I could orient the carving in different directions so that it didn't intersect with another adjacent um, section with the same orientation. But again, we're talking about tactile feel. So when you pick this up, you can feel that rim texture. Now, I'll talk about this piece a little more later. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the shape of the piece is all important. A bad shape remains a bad shape. 
no matter what you do to it in the way of beads and textures and um, embellishments of any kind. Because when the wood ages and the color goes away and the grain partially goes away, all that's left is the shape. So the shape is most important in the, in the criteria of what we're talking about. We talk about shape. This particular piece is Macassar ebony. I made this for my wife. I don't know if you can see it on the, on the screen. But the shape is all important. There happened to be a huge void in the side of this piece of wood, which begged the question, what do I do with it? Do I leave it in or do I try to get rid of it? In this case, this wood is so gorgeous that I didn't want any defects in it. So I cut that away and wound up with uh, wood that I could work with, and this was the shape that evolved. But again, we're looking at the shape and the bases, and we'll talk about that some more. That this is a multi-piece box that my wife used for a number of years um, for jewelry and so forth. The objective here was to design a shape in the, in the sense of a tower, which could be assembled or disassembled in any, any particular uh, order. Uh, the uh, Coca-Bola rings define the levels of the boxes. The lid basically reflects the base, and it's simply a shape. But the shape, as I mentioned, is all in now I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit. I made this salad bowl, and it was a terrible shape. If you look at it, it's a terrible shape. This is too fat. The rim is too narrow. So what can I do with this? So well, it's a salad bowl. Let's put some salad on it. So I dab some different colors of green on it which only made it worse. It's a terrible bowl. But it was an attempt to save a bad shape. It didn't work. But that's, again, an example. It does not flow through the base properly. Uh, the rim is too narrow. Uh, this, the inside shape could have returned better, especially if I had a wider rim. And you'll see, um, I'll compare it with this one. This one you see has a little bit wider rim, almost the same size, but I'm allowed to inset the bowl where this one is basically scooped out. So those are the improvements that I would make. Still has the, the finger hole that I like, okay? but. I would make those changes. One of my first pieces back in 01. This is a rather simple three piece box. In my opinion, okay? This box is too fat on the bottom. There's no need for this little detail here above the base. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, the knob probably should have been something else. I'm not sure about that. But it serves as a, a three-piece box. You can put brooches or whatever in there and earrings, whatever. One thing I did do that was probably appropriate was I repeated the knob with the handle of the tray and a button in the bottom. So that was maybe uh, a good thing. But there are flaws in this piece. And 
We'll talk about that later. This is box elder burl. Comes from usually comes from uh, Idaho or Utah. I bought a bunch of these uh, ten years ago from a fellow who harvested these. He was a contractor out there. I got to know him fairly well. Um, but this is very natural rim. Quick story about this, kind of interesting. When you get one of these, this has bark on it all the way around. And so the first one of these I made, I'm on the lathe with a, a little pick and the screwdrivers and everything else trying to pry this bark off. Very impossible. So I call him up. I said, well, how do you get the bark off? He said, well, you take it down to the car wash and you blast it off. So I took several down to the car wash, blasted all the bark off, went back home. Next time I went to the car wash, the great big signs, landscapers not allowed. All right, let's talk about the bases on pieces. First of all, the method of chucking can dictate the foot size. That's not good. You should either consider a removable um, uh, waste blank that you can either put a larger chuck on or whatever and then turn it off later with a um, either a, uh, a vacuum chuck or um, a jam chuck. Yes, thank you very much. I suggest you consider either a removable tenon of some kind or get some more uh, jaws for your chuck so that you have some adjustability uh, to adapt to the particular uh, piece of wood that you have. <clears throat> There's no need for a real deep spigot, as I call them, or inset. Uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch or so is sufficient, as long as you don't get a major uh, catch. Um, now in profile, we talked about profiles. I've drawn up here a number of bases, and we've seen them all. You can start with a very simple, narrow base on something like a artistic piece that has no function. You can fatten that out to accomplish a salad bowl or something like that. You can taper it back so it says I'm a base. I'm a base uh, separate from the bowl shape. You can incorporate the base into the curves of the, of the uh, bowl itself. Um, or you can uh, extend that almost like a compote. Um, I don't have an example here of that. Or you can raise it significantly similar to this. Or this one. Where you say, I am a base and I am supporting this bowl, particularly in this case. Now I'm ahead of myself a little bit. In this particular piece, the wood that I got, which is uh, waterfall babinga, is only an inch and a quarter thick. So how do you get a base on a large piece that's only an inch and a quarter thick? So I took some scraps, glued two pieces together, cut some grooves to hide the joint, and raise the entire piece up off the table. So that base type is another option when you don't have enough wood to work with. <clears throat> and again, I explained the base should be about a quarter to a third of the diameter of the piece. Unless it's a functional piece, such as a salad bowl, then it wants to be at least a half. Uh, of the major diameter. <clears throat> the base functions to visually lift the mass from the table and allow it to float when viewed from above. It's seldom viewed in profile and seldom you viewed from directly above. So when you look at a piece, um, any piece, it's typically from kind of an angle, and so the base becomes important to lift that piece off the table to allow it to uh, be seen properly. 
interior profile. Where did my chain go? You've seen this before, but I would remind you again, it's fairly well accepted that the catenary curve is the most pleasant. And so if you look at this chain as a shape of a bowl, it's not a circle. It's a catenary curve which has characteristics that make it very pleasant. And that can be used in your shop as a guide because you can do anything with it and still have a pleasant shape, even a platter. So get yourself a piece of cord that's very flexible or a chain and have it handy that you can look at to help you um, design and, and carry through in your turning with a shape that's very pleasant. But again, it can be used in any direction you want, whether it's a vase. Look at the shape of this side of the vase as characteristic to simple, simple curve. Very pleasant. Straight lines, in my opinion, are foreign to a turning. Whether it's on the side of a vessel or the top of a platter, straight lines are foreign to a, a turning of basic curves. So try to stay away from those. An asymmetric curve is always better than a plain curve. I've drawn a couple of examples here. Presumably this is a simple curve, whereas this piece has a return. As an example, would be this piece, which is not a curve. It's a compound, almost a catenary curve, that returns on itself. It is never a, a curve, a pure circle at any point. And that, to me, is more pleasant than a simple uh, uh, sphere or uh, pure circle. Again, it's raised up on a sort of a plinth base. Now, when you're planning this shape of any kind, the widest point should be at about 60% of the height. So whatever the shape might be, that was an example. I don't have a vase to show you, but a taller piece or a flat piece like this one. <clears throat> the widest point should be at about 60% of the height to be a little more pleasant in viewing. An enclosed OG should be repeated at the base. So if you have this bowl and you have an OG started, you should return this curve down here like this one to form the base. Just a repetitive curve of some sort to echo this major OG. Now the handling of convex and concurve uh, sections of a piece is very, very tricky and very difficult. If you have if you have a bowl that comes down like this and you want to simply reverse that curve that becomes very tricky because, um, I don't have a good example, because as you can imagine, can you even see this? <clears throat> I'll draw it bigger. If you have a, a, a fairly shallow curve and then you want to simply reverse that, that becomes a very tricky intersection because that'll come across like so, and that gets difficult. The same thing is true if you're trying to bring like a vase shape down and then return it. 
Again, that intersection is difficult. But again, it should be low enough so that it's probably in the area of 60 degrees reversed. But the problem with something like this is that it looks like the piece is slumping down on the table instead of being elevated, which is desirable. Okay, you've seen things on the table. Um, that are taken from various portions of the log. And if you take a bowl from here versus a bowl from here, you will get different grain patterns, right? This one will produce a bowl with rings like this. This one will produce a bowl with rings like this. So as an example of that, which again Lynn has done a very nice job with, you take this piece, I doubt if the camera can pick this up, but the, the growth of the wood is precisely centered in the bottom of the bowl. Very well done. And so that's another consideration when you mount the piece, whether you should maybe shift it a little bit, make it a little smaller maybe, or whatever, to capture that. In this case, it doesn't matter as much because they're going to be centered anyway, as long as the bowl is here. If it were over here, like this, it would not be. That's when you get kind of crazy grain which is okay, but to make it a little better, it's best to center the grain if you can. The thing to consider is if you have some wood, uh, if this log, you're using the entire piece or similar to it, if you can uh, center the new wood on both sides. The rest of this wood might do whatever it does, but this might be lighter and balanced. Uh, I don't know if I have a piece that shows that. I don't. The impression of the piece, when you see it on the table, should be reflected handling weight. Is it top heavy? Or is it bottom heavy? Is it balanced? Does it have a thick rim or a thin wall? or a thickened bottom to balance it. Think about these things as you're turning it. Rims. The rim defines the relationship of the external and internal surfaces. So that often a bead or a cove or some other detail is introduced at the intersection of the rim and the bowl to define that transition between the relatively flat rim and the bowl itself. Whether it's a platter or a bowl, it doesn't matter. The rim gives it the illusion of wall thickness. It invites touching, especially if it's colored or textured. Rims can be either level or slope in or slope out usually concave or convex, but relative, never, almost never flat. We talked about that before. Straight lines are sort of an intrusion on the round form. It's nice to undercut the rim, as we've shown in several cases, where if you have a rim that comes down to the bowl, it's nice if you can return that in somewhat because that gives you a shadow line. It makes the bowl look deeper. It's just a nice detail. Whether or not you have some detail of some kind at the juncture. A wider rim obviously gives you more options as far as uh, the treatment of that rim. Whether it's additional beads, whether it's texture, color, or whatever. There are many examples here of, of that. 
obviously, as I point this out, obviously this particular platter, it had to be flat because of the gluing process of all the little pieces. But that would be an exception. You should consider when you're uh, applying a texture or a color, whether it's the entire rim or whether it's contained in some sort of detail. Uh, most of these you will see some containment, as I call it. Instead of treating this entire rim with that texturing, it's contained on both sides so that it features the texture or the coloring as it comes around. Uh, it's also easier to carve that way, I might add, uh, but in almost all of these you will see that same treatment. Another example is this cherry crotch that does not have any beading or anything at the rim, but in each case has a containment uh, little reveal to, to define the texturing. This one would have been done after the reveals. The carving would have been done after the reveals. This one over here This one would have been done also after. And one of the reasons is, I find that when you're carving, particularly with this piece, this, this is done with a Dremel. This is done with an Automach. Do you know what an Automach is? No, what do you mean? Mo used it last month. Last month, it's a, it's a large, fairly heavy tool it has inter uh, interchangeable blades from curves to V's to different shapes. And the tool operates on a vibrating process where the, the motion is in a vertical fashion. So that in this case, when you come around to cross grain like here, there's a tendency for this wood to chip out especially on a diagonal. And so what I would do is I would have this entire rim on, off the lathe, do the carving, chip out a little bit on this inside edge, then go back and return this groove to get rid of that. With a Dremel, it's a little easier because the Dremel has a tendency not to chip out as much um, and they're also shallower. So this could be done either way. Uh, the other thing to consider is when you're carving something like this, and I'm off the subject a little bit, but this raised bead is a problem. Because when I'm using a Dremel, I'm liable to chip that, right? So I make a little shield, just out of heavy cardboard, and I put a little a little short cardboard shield around here, carve this, move it down, carve again, to prevent overcutting or, or by mistake cutting into this bead. Just out of curiosity, there's probably uh, 30 plus hours in each one of these. 30. It's all freehand. Um, this one, this one I would have drawn lines where the intersections of the different uh, directions. Uh, there, would be, there would be lines just here to define the areas. And then I would go back and carve. Uh, incidentally, um, I find it difficult to continue on the same direction as you come across. There's a tendency to start just mechanically. You want to keep turning and not staying on your direction. So I might, on this particular section here, I would put a piece of tape here and a piece of tape here just to follow that. And I take those off and move them and so forth. 
So again, you should uh, carefully consider whether this carving or, or coloring or treatment should be the entire width of the rim or whether it should be contained in some fashion. Um, I'll jump ahead to this piece. And this is another example of the auto mock. But this piece has only partial carving. Now why would that be? Can I think of a reason for that? That's part of it. Ran out of patience, that's part of it. <laughs> no, this is a tray. It's dead flat. It's used for serving a beer or a glass of wine or whatever. So you're going to hold it here, right? So I left that plain so that you could grasp the tray or hand it to someone, whatever. Uh, but still I wanted some decoration I'll call it decoration, on the surface simply to embellish the piece. So there was a reason why this is not treated the whole way like some of these others are. You go all the way around, all by eye. They're not equal, they're not the same, but they're close. So you go all the way around until you get about a couple of inches away, right? Now you go back and you measure Let's see, nine of those is uh, 65 millimeters. So I come over here and I pencil in where they should be and that finishes it. That's an added trick. Very good. You owe me a buck. <laughs> we were talking about textures. <clears throat> textures can be Dremel. Are you all familiar with Dremel and its various Tips. You have burrs, you have cutters, you have sanders, you have all kinds of things. You have Dremel, you have a Fordham. People know what a Fordham is. Basically the same thing, a rotary tool. Carving tools by hand. Some of these are finished with hand tools where I can't get in with a, with a machine. Automat, which I mentioned. Burning. Uh, there's several Sorby texturing tools. Um, there are various burrs available and so forth for these tools. And obviously consideration of applied finishes. There's an infinite variety of paints, dyes, paste, applied textures, uh, gold leaf, those kinds of things. Grooves, beads, coves, color, texture, stain, carving can all be applied without distracting from the profile, which we've talked about. If applied judiciously, care must be taken not to overly emphasize treatment. Surface treatment tends to be overdone. You've probably seen some pieces like that. Beads will always look best if applied to the surface. If you have a curve, you want beads to do this rather than this. These will always look better than those with some exception. So in your planning of the piece, when you're turning this, you need to turn out here somewhere, apply whatever beads you have in mind, and then cut back to the first and second beads here. Adding beads, coves, and grooves to demonstrate skill is not necessarily advisable from an aesthetic standpoint. You can't just add a bunch of stuff to a bad shape and improve it. Mark Lindquist said a long time ago, a turning approaches being perfect when nothing can be added or subtracted. So remember that. It approaches perfect when nothing can be added or subtracted. <clears throat>
Consider applied finish carefully. Dull, semi-gloss, and gloss. Reflections on a pepper mill or a candle holder or a, a small ornament or something is fine. But a gloss finish on a, a bowl or a platter is not advisable because the light source simply reflects the surface and you do not see the grain. So most of my work is either relatively dull or semi-gloss. I've made several hundred turbines over the years. Rarely or never a perfect one. That's your opinion. That's my opinion. And I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of these pieces on the table can be improved if ever so subtly. It might be a curve, it might be the width of a rim, it might be a particular detail. It can be improved. Can you go back and do it again? Probably not. Can you try to replicate it? Maybe. But these are not perfect pieces. <clears throat> I routinely visit, revisit my work and criticize and evaluate it. I can always find improvement. Base size, combination of curves, rim width, terminations, details, applied finish, etc. can all be improved. <clears throat> now let's talk about that a little bit. This rim right here, in my view, is a little too wide relative to the bowl shape. If I were to do it again, I'd have reduced this by maybe a quarter of an inch and maybe pushed everything over a little bit. But in my opinion, this rim um, is overdone from a width standpoint relative to the bowl. This rim is probably a little too narrow. If I were to do that again, I would have made this another, oh, maybe a quarter or even three-eighths wider. Because, in my view, the width of this rim does not define the platter uh, shape sufficiently. Backtrack just slightly here. This vessel, <clears throat> again, we talk about the 60 degree or 60 percent level. This band is right at about 60% you know, but above that you'll notice that these two uh, uh, little uh, bands, oh, good word, little bands are repeated on the bottom which goes back to what I was saying much earlier about repetition of detail if you can do that. Again with Len Widmer's piece Here's again repetition of the banding that's very well done and diminishes in size as it goes down. It's just a very well done piece. You've seen this at, at Worcester. But again the repetition. This piece I was going to point out before and I missed it. This is a piece that you might say has a focal point. In this particular case, uh, this uh, red mealy burl had a huge chainsaw mark right through the top of that um, relatively flat. It was all chainsawed, but it was a real deep cut right there. So I said to myself, I can either make this a lot smaller and lose a lot of this, or I can do something to make an accent. So I said, okay, I'll just groove that out with a, say, a radial arm saw and add a piece of cocoboa, which accomplished, if I can say so, a focal point for this particular piece. So flaws in the wood sometimes turn out to be an advantage if you consider what can be done with them. Tom brought this in. It's really a terrible piece. <laughs> <laughs> this is very well done. You'll notice the repetition of this 
cone shape with the base. So there's repetition here. The finial's well done. It's a well done piece. The only criticism I have is this arch and this little bowl of the box is one piece. I personally would have thought it improved if you took the arch out of the cherry and made the same top and bottom of the same species of wood so that this curve continued through as if this were inset in the arch. That's the only criticism I might have. Criticizing my work a moment ago, um, you can always find improvement. Base size, combination of curves, the rim width, which I talked about, uh, terminations and details, they can all be improved. Uh, finishes can always be improved. <clears throat> I challenge you to review your past work and look at it critically and see how you could improve it the next time whether it be details or, or whatever. <clears throat> I also would ask you to look at the show and tell table and evaluate work critically with your mouth shut. <laughs> Why is one piece better than another? What would you change on the pieces on the table? How could you make them better? Think about how they feel. Pick them up. If you go to a art show, uh, you'll find that people, first thing they do with a piece of wood is pick it up. You don't do that with ceramics or glass or fabrics or paintings or anything. Wood turning is the only thing that you grasp almost immediately. You look at the bottom. <clears throat> Compliment the maker of outstanding work that's on the table over there. A, this is a relatively plain piece of wood. Yes, it has grain, but if you compare that to um, a burl, obviously, uh, there's a burl over there that was on the other table. <clears throat> This wasn't part of my package here. You know, you wouldn't think about uh, texturing that rim under any circumstances. The wood is, is, is just exploding from a visual standpoint. So you wouldn't want to mess with that. Texture it, color it, do anything with it. I did put a very small bead because it, without that, if you can imagine this piece without that bead, it'd be extremely plain, it still is plain. But at least it defines where the rim comes over and meets the bowl. So with uh, marble wood or zebra wood or any of those that have real wild grain, you want to make a very, very simple shape. It's a platter, a bowl, no matter what it is. A planer woods, you know, this is walnut. We all know what walnut looks like. But I felt, uh, right or wrong, that this particular piece needed some sort of emphasis at the rim. So I put it on there. But again, it's a relatively plain piece of wood. And you can do that with cherry or walnut, mahogany, uh, babinga, which I've done. I would, I would also comment along that same line, every one of these pieces, before it comes off the lathe, I feel it with my eyes closed. Because you will feel differentiations in curve, little humps, little valleys, especially on the inside of a bowl, that you cannot see. Another trick is to have a fluorescent light that you can go under and look at it. And if you see ripples in the light, that means it doesn't have a smooth curve. It should have a very continuous curve when you look at it under light. I have nothing against a heavy piece, especially 
if it's a visual piece rather than a utilitarian. I don't know if I have any really heavy pieces. The, the problem with wood is um, hard maple is very heavy. Babinga is very heavy. If you pick up these platters over here, they look like they might be light, but they're not because Babinga is very heavy wood. So no matter what you do to it, you're still going to have the weight there. Uh, but you're absolutely right, it, the, and I think I mentioned that, that the visual impression on the table should follow through when you pick it up. <clears throat> uh, but when I have <clears throat> when I have a piece like this on the on the lathe, I've got the back finished. I'm working on the front. I will typically stand back six feet. See where should the rim be? I'll draw a pencil line. You'll, lathe is running. Draw a pencil line. Ah, uh, it should be a little narrower. Draw another pencil line. Get to where I think it should be. Then I'll take a parting tool and make a groove outside of my line. And I look at it again. I say, well, maybe that line's right. Maybe it's not. Move it in a little bit. And I'll keep playing with it. Once you get your parting tool in there, you're committed. Okay? But it gives me a sense of the total proportion of the piece relative to the rim. You also have to consider what you're going to do with that rim later. Because if you're going to texture the whole thing, whether you're going to have a bead and, and march this uh, texturing back some, all that has to be in your mind as you, as you do it. But <clears throat> To answer the question directly, I would say after the piece is finished, several days later I look at it again, uh, I screwed up, should have been a little narrower, but you can't go back. And, and some, of, some of the pieces I've made, I feel the rim is just about the right proportion, others are not. But we all have that problem. I mentioned before, this, this piece, if I did this again, I'd, I'd have a look at that and i say, eh, it's too wide. Next time I'll make it a little narrower. Uh, or the other one I made a little bigger. Again, revisit your work. Revisit things over there. And say, well, this was a 12-inch piece and the rim was 2 inches or whatever. Bring a tape measure. Measure. Well, the guy's not looking. <coughs> whatever. Um, but revisit your work and say, well, next time I'll make it a little wider, a little narrower, a little higher, whatever. Any other questions?